We have been preparing for months. Ships from across the Union are arriving daily. We are carefully and quietly closing on the Federation border. System by system, station by station, we slowly creep towards Federation space. Our foe remains oblivious as we lay the foundations of their destruction. We're some 80 light years from our own space. They would never know to look for us here. The systems behind us have been transformed into supply bases and shipping ports. A literal road to victory, and all in just a few months. Now we stand poised to strike and our enemy is none the wiser. Almost 900 ships stand ready to sweep across the border at a moment's notice. When we do, we shall leave nothing but blood and fire in our wake. We are the scalpel cutting into the heart of the Federation. We will open her up and leave her people to bleed. They have given this operation a code name, Yargaresh, Judgment. I know that this will be the battle to finally settle this terrible war. After their defeat in Operation Return, four months of Dominion gains were undone in under a fortnight, with the Dominion being driven back to the edge of Cardassian territory, the front line extending from the Black Cluster across the McAllister Nebula, the Badlands and the Volterra Nebula, all the way to the Telerian border. With 12 major Federation worlds trapped behind this new front line, perhaps the most significant of these with the systems of Iadara, Epsilon, and Cerebus. Iadara was the home of a major shipyard, while Cerebus and Epsilon played host to major starbases. And it was this infrastructure which would provide the Dominion a new lease of life in the Alpha Quadrant. That May, Vorta planners undertook an assessment of the previous offensive to ascertain what went wrong and how the Federation had been able to so quickly take the initiative. At the furthest extent of their advance, the Dominion had captured 15 Federation sectors with only 32 fleets, totaling just over 3,200 ships spread across the front line. What was immediately clear was that the Dominion had overstretched their forces, leaving captured systems unsecured later in the advance as their supply lines became stretched. The more the Dominion advanced, the more depleted their fleets became, whilst the enemy fleets continued to grow in size. But ultimately their downfall was in how thin their front line was. When Starfleet launched Operation Return, attacking with six fleets concentrated against a single Dominion fleet, they were forced back two entire sectors before a large enough fleet could be assembled to stop them. It was thus clear that in any future operations, the Dominion should have fleets deployed in depth behind the front line so as to counter any potential breakthroughs. Additionally, it was concluded that this overstretched position had been the result of poorly chosen war objectives. Instead of going after the Klingon and Federation fleets, the Dominion had instead being content to take territory in the belief that capturing key Federation homeworlds would force them to surrender. However, the Federation proved to be too large to be easily overrun. Additionally, it was concluded that while the Klingons had been slow to respond in the first months of the war, by April they were holding a sizable portion of the front and were able to achieve a similar breakthrough in support of Operation Return. It was therefore clear to the Dominion that if they wished to defeat the Federation, they could not do so while also fighting the Klingons. It was also clear that the capture of planets was not in itself an objective. Rather, their objective should be the destruction of enemy fleets, as doing so would degrade Starfleet's ability to counterattack or maneuver, giving more tactical options to both the Jem'Hadar and Cardassian fleets. Another key factor was that the Dominion had been forced to attack well before they were ready. 
With Starfleet mining the wormhole, it forced the Dominion's hand and forced them to start the war well before they were ready, and this meant that they had far fewer Jem'Hadar than were needed, frequently forcing the Vorta to rely on their Cardassian allies for support. Now with no hope for reinforcements from the Gamma Quadrant, the Dominion began to set up their own infrastructure in Cardassian and occupied Federation space to rebuild their numbers for the next phase of the war. Between May and October, the Dominion assembled five Cardassian and three new Jem'Hadar fleets, increasing their total to 2,800 ships, yet of these only 1,600 were deployed to the border. The rest were held back in preparation for an ambitious new offensive. This plan was developed jointly by Legate Masset and Vorta Liana, codenamed Operation Shadabesh, Shadow Boxing. This was the overall plan for an ambitious deception by the Dominion. This itself was split into two separate operations. Operation Rishkatar would take place on the northern flank of the Federation and would involve the deployment of four raiding fleets, both Cardassian and Jem'Hadar. Not only would these raiding fleets interdict and disrupt Starfleet logistics, they would lead Starfleet to believe that a major offensive was imminent on that front, forcing them to redeploy forces from other areas of the line. This was all in service of the true offensive. On the far side of Federation space, rather than attack the front line directly, Masset and Liana proposed to outflank the front line by way of the Calandra Sector. The Calandra Sector was unclaimed space and largely uncharted, with no known colonies or modern infrastructure. Starfleet would never expect an attack so far from Cardassian space, yet launching such an audacious attack would not be easy. 800 starships would have to make the 85 light year journey undetected, and they would need all the modern infrastructure needed to support large fleet movements. Prior to aligning with the Dominion, such an undertaking was unthinkable, but with the help of Dominion technology, this was now a possibility. As the Dominion fleets moved towards their staging areas, they would deploy a series of modular supply bases and depots along their route. First and foremost of these new constructions was the Fau Fortress. Adjacent to Starbase Akali, it would be the primary supply hub for the entire front and could also serve as a fortified fallback position. Fleets would also be stationed at smaller supply bases nearer to the Federation border, including BT-3376, BD-9127, and the Calandra Sector itself, which would be the base of the Dominion's main thrust. Preparations were slow and meticulous. The Dominion had to buy the silence of the Telerians and Tentheki, who frequently ran shipping through the sector. Every ship had to be issued with a false transponder and had to reconfigure its warp coils so as to appear as a civilian freighter. Despite the immensity of this undertaking, the Federation and Klingons, who now held a sizable portion of the front, were none the wiser as to the Dominion's designs. And by the end of August, they would be ready to strike. However, the Dominion were not the only ones planning an offensive. Growing increasingly impatient, the Klingons had decided to undertake their own offensive to drive the Dominion out of the Argelius sector and liberate occupied Federation worlds. Gowron and the High Council believed that if they were successful, it would persuade Starfleet to also go on the offensive. Leading the Klingon fleets was Field Marshal Kurak, a student of the great General Chang. He planned his offensive on the classical model of Chang, leading with a series of hammer blows against the enemy front line to draw out their reserves and then infiltrate behind enemy lines and destroying their now unprotected infrastructure. With five fleets on the front lines and an additional two in reserve by August, Kurak was ready to launch his offensive, codenamed Operation Blood Pie, unaware that he and his fleets would soon be in Dominion sights. Operation Blood Pie began on September 6th, with the Chancellor's second raiders and the fourth strike fleet converging on Argelius, easily driving out the 18th order 
while the sixth sons of Khan tied down the 14th order at Atalia. However, the Jem'Hadar garrison remained entrenched on Argelius, which was not subdued until the 20th. Meanwhile, the 8th Calus Chosen and 7th Brothers of Borel relieved the Federation 11th and 10th fleets, which withdrew to Belarus Prime and Beta Z respectively. While the Klingon offensive was a surprise to both Maset and Liana, it was not entirely unwelcome, as it now meant that the Klingons were further inside the trap devised for them, and so they delayed the offensive to October to allow the Klingons more time to drive further into their line. And so, on September 16th, the Klingons moved to the second stage of their offensive, with the Kalos Chosen and Sons of Khan driving the Fourth Order from Atalia. Yet, as they did so, the Dominion made their move, with Operation Yagaresh commencing on October 1st. The Dominion had achieved total surprise over the Federation, taking eight systems in just two weeks, including the planet Beta Z. While the 10th Fleet had been stationed there, they were not expecting an attack, and when the Dominion arrived on the 18th, they were engaged in a training exercise. Two of the battle groups were engaged in a simulated deep space battle, and they were the first to be picked off. Though a few stragglers did make it back to the planet to warn the fleet, they were too late, as already the Jem'Hadar vanguard had already engaged them. Admiral Mahdi initially believed this to be just a small raid, but as more and more Jem'Hadar poured into the system, he realized this was a full-scale invasion. While he did his best to organize a defense, so much of his fleet was scattered and isolated, and the Jem'Hadar made sure they could not regroup. Nor did the planetary defense systems offer much help. Being older models, they were easily destroyed by the Dominion Polaron beams. Recognizing there was nothing he could do, he ordered any surviving ships to fall back to Maclex. But he could not join them, as he had been cut off by the Dominion. While he and his squadron stood their ground, they were easily swept aside by the Jem Hadar, who then began landing ground troops, and less than 10 hours hence were in complete control of the planet's surface. While this was a massive blow against Federation morale, the capture of Beta Z was only a secondary objective towards their ultimate goal, the encirclement of the entire Klingon front. Now having reached Beta Z, the Dominion moved to close the pocket, with the Cardassian 15th Order moving to Nami, where they would link up with the rest of Fleet Group Gamma, who would close the pocket in Operation Skria Katar, Scorpion's Claw. Two Jem'Hadar fleets, along with the Cardassian 16th, 18th, 20th and 21st Orders, attacked the 2nd Raiders and 4th Strike Fleet at Argelius. Shocked by the size and scale of this counter-attack, the Klingons could do little more than fall back, lest they be obliterated by a force three times greater. And so, by the 28th of October, the Dominion had completely closed the Volterra pocket, trapping therein four Klingon fleets and the Federation 9th Fleet, and this was the Dominion's primary goal all along. By encircling and destroying the Klingon fleet, Maset and Liana believed that it may well force the Klingons out of the war altogether, or at the very least, it would destroy the Klingons' ability to mount any meaningful offensives in the near future. Having achieved their goal of trapping a large portion of the Klingon fleet, Maset and Liana were authorized by the founder to proceed with phase two of the plan, carving an ever larger chunk out of the Federation. On the 8th of November, the Cardassian 18th Order, along with two Jem'Hadar fleets, take Oceanius, outflanking the Federation line, with no one opposing them. The Jem'Hadar advance further to Kataria and Belana, by the 16th threatening to once again surround the Federation line. Meanwhile, the Dominion sets about destroying the fleet trapped in the Volterra pocket, destroying the 9th fleet at New Helena. And as November turned to December, the Dominion continues its sweeping advance, with the Federation spread too thinly to counter their maneuvers. On December 5th, a Jem'Hadar fleet and the Cardassian 21st Order drove the 11th fleet out of Machus, securing their exposed flanks, while the Jem'Hadar reached Romatis and were now within striking range of Benzar. 
Fortunately for the Federation, by December 6th, the newly formed 16th Fleet mustered around Benzar, and two Klingon fleets were moving into position on either flank and were less than a sector away at Archon and Harley. But they would not arrive in time, as on the 22nd, the Dominion attacked Benzar, with the Jem'Hadar fleet engaging the 16th fleet head-on, whilst elements from the neighbouring Jem'Hadar fleet and Cardassian 18th Order attacked their flanks. Isolated with his nearest help still some time away, Admiral Folner was forced to fall back to Regulus, surrendering yet another homeworld to the Dominion's relentless advance. In only three months, Maset and Liana had taken 23 Federation worlds, swept across eight sectors, destroying some 300 enemy ships in the process, and unlike their last offensive, the Dominion line was supported in depth, with 12 fleets across the entire front. And so, even as Starfleet reinforcements arrived, liberating these worlds would not be an easy undertaking. They would not enjoy the fruits of surprise and maneuver as the Dominion had. The road to liberation would be a long one, soaked in blood, something that President Rosarev acknowledged in a speech that he made on the 31st of December, 2374. My fellow Federation citizens, this morning I spoke with the Chief of Staff and he has confirmed to me that the Dominion has taken control of Benzar. My thoughts today are with the people of that cherished world and all Benzites across the Federation. But let me assure you, our fight is far from over. General Kirak tells me that the Klingons trapped in the Altera pocket remain in good spirits and will not give up without a fight. Their defiance has tied down some 500 Dominion ships. On other fronts, decrypted communiques from Beta Z reveal that the 4th Cardassian Prefect sent to administrate their occupation has resigned only a week after taking the job. This is no doubt thanks to the plucky defiance of the Betazoid people. Far away in the depths of space, Romulan warbirds are about to join battle with over 300 Jem'Hadar ships. We wish our Romulan allies good hunting. The Dominion has mounted a most impressive campaign, one that will surely go down in the annals of history, a history we shall yet stand to write. And when we speak of the Calandra Offensive, we may write a paragraph or two on the strategic brilliance of the Dominion, but the chapter shall be the story of resolute resolve and defiant determination. And when they turn that page, they will read of our triumph as we weather this, our darkest hour.